Our dear viewers and listeners, we greet you all in the precious and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to today's Bible study. And as you invite somebody to join, would like to take this moment and dedicate this session to God in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your word. For there is life in your word. And for that we thank you. We give you the praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Today we will take our reading from the book of Romans chapter 1 and we shall read from verse 19 to verse 23. The Bible says because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. Nor were thankful but became futile in their thoughts. And their foolish hearts were darkened professing to be wise they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. In this text, we are continuing on this journey. Last week, we saw why the gospel is necessary. And to align it to what we stated last week. We discovered that without the gospel, all men of all walks of life outside of the relationship with Jesus Christ are under the wrath of God. And the word wrath is the Greek word oge which refers to his determined, settled indignation against sinful mankind. It is that holy vengeance that is set against anything that is not holy. So this righteous indignation is set against everything that does not conform to his righteousness. And so the Bible tells us that this wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in righteousness. Now, having seen this, we then saw that God has a standard and he will not come down on this standard. Now, what that means is that everyone 
Buliomu, who does not believe in Jesus Christ has not met that standard. And the wrath of God is upon them. And we saw the extreme of this wrath where God gives you up. And why is that so? Because God is not silent. God is continuously revealing himself. Revealing his grace and mercy to mankind. Revealing his various attributes to us. With the objective that men will draw nigh to him. So when a person does not draw to God but draws away from him that is what we call the rejection of God and all humanity is judged by this inflexible justice based on whether they have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ or not. So you may ask, how has God revealed himself? And this is where we begin today's text. It begins by saying, because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. Here Paul is saying that God's revelation of himself is evident to all people. And the revelation of God to humanity is in two phases. There is what we call the general revelation. This is God's self-disclosure. But not in a saving way. But in a way that says, look here. I am God, I am in charge. And there are various attributes that regard to his existence that God has chosen to reveal to man. Paul explains and says, for God has shown it to them. This is very important. Why is it important? Because no man has ever found God on his own. No man will ever find God on his own. It, it is God who takes the initiative to reveal himself to man. And so it is up to man then to respond to the initiative God has made. So if God is to be known, he discloses himself. And then it is up to us to respond to what God has revealed about himself. So that is the general, there is the general revelation. And we see that all over all creation. And then there is what we call the special revelation. This is principally through his word. We saw that in verse 2 of chapter 1. We saw that also in verse 17 of chapter 1. So this revelation, which we call the special revelation, is the one that draws the person to the path of salvation. It is the one that draws men 
into a relationship with God. A relationship where they are saved from the wrath of God. And principally, that's the reason why we preach the gospel. Because Romans 10, 17 tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when you hear the word, the Spirit of God who has moved the preacher to preach then prods at your heart to receive this gospel. So when you positively respond to this then the saving grace is revealed to you. And this is the special revelation that we find in the word of God. So either way, the message is this, God is not silent. He is continuously revealing himself. And in verse 20, the Bible says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible, his, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen. He notes three things here. He says his invisible attributes so you may not see them with your physical eyes. They are not physically discerned, but they are evident. And then the Bible says his eternal power and divine nature. It says these have been clearly seen from the creation of the world. So God is in the business of self-revelation. You see, the challenge we have is that we want to know God intellectually. And yet we don't, what we fail to understand is that humans a by and large three dimensional. So our mind is finite. We cannot discern intellectually an infinite God. Because for everything that we discern, we discern it in three dimensions in the dimension of time in the dimension of matter in the dimension of space. So matter, time, and space, everything of ours hangs around there. So, so that's why questions like what, where, when are so frequently used by us. D and we want to discern God intellectually using a what, when, where. It can't happen because God is infinite and your finite mind cannot understand an infinite God. Save when God chooses to reveal himself to us. And the Bible says since the creation of the world, these invisible attributes are clearly seen. And what are his invisible attributes? One that comes to mind is his omnipotence. His absolute power. 
you say we can choose to be blind to many things but we cannot be blind to the fact that he there is a creator who possesses all power yeah, recently I was watching a documentary and it was talking about how my, how the the different planets and all came into being and when they began to talk about it they kept talking about explosions and it did not make sense to me how an explosion then brings order it's like I, I began to envision like a junkyard, a car, a car park. Oh, oh, so if you have a car park and an explosion, a bomb goes off. Then as a result of that bomb, you have a brand new car you are driving out. So all the parts somehow begin to get together and there you are, boom. The engine gets together and there you are, car fueled, fueled and ready to go. It's, it's crazy. Because when you explode, things scatter. Now, now you want to tell us that order came out of disorder. When the explosion happened, then order came. That points to power. God is saying, I am here. I am visible. My invisible attributes are being displayed every day. There is a power beyond what humans can comprehend. And this is the power of a creator. One who brings everything to perspective. Gets mountains in place. Gathers rivers, gathers oceans, gathers water bodies in place. And ensures that there is a flow of life. That is undeniable. It speaks of power such immense power beyond what we can actually conceive with our mind. The other attribute that comes to perspective is what the Bible calls his eternal power. God is continually communicating the fact that he existed before all creation. Uh, 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 somebody asked me a question sometime and asked when God had not created anything, where was God? And I said, you got it all wrong. Because when you talk about when, then you're talking about time. God is before time. He spoke time into existence. So when you bring him into the context of time, you are getting eternity and squeezing it into time. And it cannot happen that way. Why? Because... He is eternal. He is the first cause. You see, we live in a, a, a world of cause and effect. That's why we have the word because. You are 
you have be and then cause. So things exist because there is a cause. Now, God is the first cause. So everything flows through him. And that's why the Bible comes back to us and say it calls Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith. When Jesus comes in the book of Revelation, he refers to himself as the one who was. That means he's the first cause who is present and who is to come. So everything past, present, and future is him. So when you talk about history, it is his story that is being unfolded. When we talk about the future, it is him trying to tell us, this is what I have planned long ago before you ever were. Why? Because he is eternal. And so, having understood that, you then get to understand that there is no explosion that brought into existence what you see. There is an outside force. And this force is a person. He is God. His eternal power brought in existence everything that we see. The third aspect is his wisdom. God is all wise. They usually say he's omniscient. When you look at creation, there is undeniably the fact that there is a design that points to a designer. When, when you look at how creatures come into being, when you look at how an egg becomes a caterpillar, then it becomes a butterfly. When you see, when you read and find out the physiology of man and how man is formed, or, or just even a part of man, just the eye, or the brain, and look at it from the time of the conception, and how all these nerves get to be able to coordinate all the activities and switch on every part of the body. And if any comes short, then you have a malfunction. How do you get that to the DD? How does this part know I need to connect with this at this time? All this points to a design. All this, when you look at the seasons, when you look at the times, when you look at Oh, for the people who stay abroad, you have winter, you have summer, you have autumn, you have spring. For those who stay here, we have the rainy season, we have the dry season. Now, for those who go up further and look at astronomy, you look at the way the earth is tilted. 
It's distance from the sun. And you understand that if it were closer, then it would be too hot. If it were farther, then it would be too cold. So how does it get that orbit? And gets into this cycle where it is able to support life. So this, you may try to explain it. But at the end of the day, it points to a design. It points to somebody who is wise. And this is none other than the perfect wisdom of God being revealed. So God has revealed himself and the Bible tells us he is understood through what he has made. So that means we have no excuse. The intellect he gives you is for you to discern that he is here. And every day, faithfully, season after season, year after year, he continues to reveal himself to us. Why? Why? So that you and I have no excuse whatsoever. So his revelation of through creation is so that you and I can perceive through our senses that there is someone in charge. But what has been the result of this? Paul explains in verse 21 and verse 22 because you would have expected that this revelation brings people to acknowledge that there is is a first cause. There is a designer behind this wonderful thing that we see. You see, I, I get amazed when people come to tour and they go to look at all these wonderful creations and they begin to call it Mother Nature. That's despicable. Oh, look at what is happening. God has made himself known. But do you know what? Rather than people drawing to God, because the objective of him revealing himself is that men will be drawn to him. Yet what is happening is instead of drawing to him, the opposite is happening. They refuse to draw nigh to him. They refuse, they reject everything he puts before them. They try to explain away everything. And the Bible says, for even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God. All give thanks. And the knowledge here is not the saving knowledge. The knowledge here is the general knowledge that, that men may be drawn to him and therein find the way to salvation. But that is not happening. Here the Bible says they did not honor him. They did not give him the glory that he deserves. They did not call upon him. They did not humble themselves before him. They did not seek him. 
In another portion of scripture, Paul is saying there is none that is seeking after him. And so the second thing the Bible tells us is that they do not give thanks. What describes ungodliness? One of them is lack of honor to God. Acknowledging that he is in charge. The other is the lack of giving thanks. It is so, so disheartening that in a time where people even have a thanksgiving day. And the question is, thank who? Thank what? For what? So, so what is done on Thanksgiving? People bring turkeys and eat. But they are not acknowledging God as the source of everything concerning their lives. They are not expressing thanks for what he has provided. They are not thanking him for the food that he has made available. For the breath that they take. Uh, During the COVID period, I had a number of friends who were hospitalized. And what shocked me was how expensive it is to place somebody on life support for an entire day or an entire month. So later we had to contribute to get some of them to pay their bills. And I kept asking myself, when have I been thankful for the air that I breathe without having to pay for it? You see, there's certain things that God brings our way just for us to have the understanding that we should ideally be giving thanks. So even though he has self-revealed, we are still not thankful. Uh, One time I was, when I was studying science, and uh, so we are talking about the composition of the gases in the air. And then it dawned on me that the oxygen that you need is not even the highest in composition in the gases that you have in the air. It only accounts for 21%. So the other gases which make the 79 have the majority But God has given you a system that that is able to filter the 21 and leave out the 79 and be able to provide what you need to be alive and bring in place other things like plants to be able to replenish what you have spent. Now, look at that order. Look at that interdependence. Look at that design. But what happens? People reject the truth about God. And when we reject the truth about God, it puts us in a very dangerous place. Bible says, Bible when you reject God, here Paul says Paul that Agamba. they became vain or they became futile in their speculations. You see, when you reject God as the first cause, 
Buliwoga, but Katonda see a mutan DC. You begin to speculate. I was Zemukutevereza. And the Bible says, Bible Yagaba, these are vain speculation. Vino Okotevereza Kuno Kwam Pakate Kulimu. Vain is the word futile. Even to be no Okoli Chechile to Okoli Vitali. It is the Greek word Matayo. Chechucho Jamu Yona and it's a Matayo. And Matayo means. It is useless thinking, worthless thinking. It is foolishness. So what happens? You are conjured up. Your mind becomes dark. It becomes empty. About who God is. And then you begin to imagine how this could have happened. So you begin to create. And this is how idolatry comes in. Because you, whatever you create, that takes the place of God then becomes an idol in your life. So in so doing, in those vain speculations, you begin to create something after your imagination. And why do people create something out of their imagination? The reason is that we don't want to be accountable. So we know that once you acknowledge that there is a God, then you are accountable to him. Once you reject him, then you create what you think. So that idea then becomes your God. So Paul here says they become futile, they become matayo in their speculation. And speculation is the word dialogismos. Now, dialogismos is a negative word. It is a degrading word. It is basically what it means that instead of your thinking going up, your thinking comes down. You become nonsensical. So you, you become plagued by your empty thoughts. You begin to think what God is like. And you sink into a hole of blasphemy. But the Bible says, and Paul says, their foolish heart became darkened. The word foolish there is the word moros, where we get the English word moron. Now, here, that means when you reject God, you are going into a darkened place. And now you are trying to find your way in the dark. That act alone is moronic. You see, you have left the light and are now groping around in the darkness. Trying to use your imagination to be able to figure out what you should have plainly seen in the light. You see, the Bible says the light has come, but men have preferred the darkness. So I want you who is listening and watching us today. Where are you? Are you in the light of God's word? Are you in the light of his salvation? Or are you groping around in the darkness? 
trying to figure out who God is. Using your finite mind to try to figure out what is infinite. The Bible then goes on to say that professing to be wise, they became fools. Verse 22. In other words, they are, you see, people have written theses. Thousands and thousands of documents. But all this is being blindsided. This is nonsensical. So their intellect is leading them through a path of darkness into darkness. And the Bible says they have become fools. So instead of being wise, they become the opposite. Why? Because the basic questions of life cannot be answered by your intellect. Questions like who am I? Where do I come from? Where am I going? What is life all about? What is my purpose here? How am I to live? What is death? What happens after death? You don't answer this by your intellect. This you answer when you are in the light. When the light of the world reveals the response to this question. So what happens then? It does not end there. I told you this is spiring. You reject reject God. You become vain in your speculation. You are groping around in in your darkness. Instead of becoming wise, you are becoming foolish. So the more you search, the more foolish you become. And the ultimate, verse 23, is you begin now to replace God. So, and when you get to that point, God gives you up. So what began as rejecting the truth about God? So what happens? Then you become insane in your result. Then after that, first 23 tells us, you now begin to replace God with idolatry. So idolatry is not man climbing higher in their thoughts about God. No, it is man spiraling down into a debased state of thinking and life. Life is found in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. He says, I am the resurrection. I am the life. The life of God comes when you connect with God. When we don't do that, then we exchange that life for something else. So we replace the glory of God because we are created in his image. So when we reject God, we then replace him the glory which is his glory in us. The doxa 
in us. We then replace it for something else. So we end up trading a treasure for a trash of lies. Imagine going to a marketplace to buy a supermarket and you walk past all the stalls and then go to the rubbish pit where they are throwing all the rubbish. And that is where you begin to search for what has been placed in the stalls. So you, you end up buying high and selling low for the worst of sort. So you're exchanging what is of inestimable value. And now exchanging it for what is worthless. Basically, that is what happens. The Bible says they exchange the glory of an incorruptible God. And the word there is the word of a throtus. Now this word means that God who does not decay, he never dies. Now you are extending that image for what is corrupt. Think about it. Are you in the right sense of mind? You extend the knowledge of the ever living God. For what your intellect can supply. And when that happens, the Bible says, then God gave them up. So when you continually reject his revelation, and then you begin to replace whatever is in the image of God with what is worthless. Three things happen. And we see them in verse 24, 26, and 28. The Bible says in 24 that God gave them over in the last of their hearts to impunity. And in verse 26, God gave them over to degrading passions. And in verse 28, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. So their mind and their hearts, their passions are all spiraling downward. That is the path when men reject God. So how are we to live in light of this? The Bible says, and we saw that in verse 21, our lives should be lived to the glory of God. And the only way to get to this path is in Jesus Christ. The second is to live a life that gives thanks. And this is very critical for us. And especially believers in Jesus Christ. Having now received him, we ought to live a grateful life. You say, what is it that characterizes gratefulness? One of it is worship. You say, you can't worship and complain. You can't worship and grumble. You can't worship and whine. 
So ako sins and ne no yomba. See the reason why you are whining is because you're not worshiping. So ngarachi o yomba yomba kubanga oganyo kubongo wa kusins. Say what should be on your lips? Chandi bande kumimwa. Should be worship. Kusins as a believer grateful for what God has done. Go mukiriza ngo uwe baza katonda byakusere. Often we focus on what we don't have. But what is it that you have? You have the best gift of all. Salvation. God in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That is something to be grateful about. Every day of your life. Thanking him for his provision. Thanking him for his protection. Thanking him for salvation. That your future is secure in him. Thanking him for the present. Because the Holy Spirit, the precious Holy Spirit, dwells in you. He's here to guide. He's here to preserve. He's here to regenerate. He's here to make sure that you conform to the image of Christ. That is something to That is something to be grateful about. When you find yourself whining, you are an ungrateful person. Number three. After that, you need to be a witness. A witness of what Christ has done. And our witness is not just us, what we talk about God. What we witness about God is revealed in what we declare. It is revealed in how we live. It is revealed in the way we conduct ourselves. Does love define how you live? All it is hatred. Let's go back to the basics. You see, God Katonda. is not silent. From creation, he is revealing himself. Even you who is watching us right now, and you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, this evening he is revealing himself to you as a savior. As a redeemer, will you surrender your life to him? Why didn't you say this prayer? Say, dear God of glory, the creator of the universe, from time immemorial, you are revealing yourself to creation. And I have been drawing further away from you. Lord, I am a sinner. I need a savior. Save me, Jesus. Wash me, Jesus. Cleanse me, Jesus. Claim me as your own. Forgive my sins. Give me in your life. Thank you, Lord. Fill me with your spirit and help me to live for you. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you say that, it's not about the words. It is believing with your heart what Christ has done. And once you believe, something happens. The power of God that is resident in His Word explodes in you. And the new you begins to be made man. The old is gone and the new has come. That is what defines who you are right now. For the believer in Jesus Christ, we have a witness to do.
we have to give glory to God. We have to be a grateful people. And we have to witness to others about Jesus Christ. Let's spread this message. God is not silent. He will reveal himself. God, richly bless you. From Dominion Church, we are saying shalom. Till we meet again. God bless you.